Thank goodness. We are actually playing baseball. It's April. The Atlanta Braves are playing baseball, and that means it is time to kick off the regular season of Behind the Braves, the official podcast of the Atlanta Braves. I am Ricky Mast, digital media content manager for the Atlanta Braves, virtually alongside director of Braves alumni relations, Greg McMichael and Greg, uh, we're in good spirits sitting here because we're sitting here. We're in the midst of game two of a, of a doubleheader against the Nationals. We just picked up our first win here a couple hours ago, hoping for another one uh, here shortly. A uh, little rough 0-4 start there, but, hey, we got the first win out of the way, and I think that's kind of uh, kind of relieves a little bit of the pressure. It's it's As our guest today points out, it's it's much more magnified when it's you start 0-4 as opposed to an 0-4 stretch in the middle of the season somewhere. But uh, but uh, speaking, I guess I should uh, go ahead and talk about our guest, a little, little fellow you all may have heard of before named Chipper Jones. Uh, he's a new coach, new coach with this year's team. Um, so thought we, we, we might want to have one of the coaches on. Uh, no, this is this is a thrill. Your old teammate, uh, Hall of Famer, team Hall of Famer. I mean, goodness gracious, one of the greatest Braves uh, to ever put on a uniform, one of the greatest baseball players to ever put on a uniform. And it's uh, it's great to have him on. He took off. Great to have him take some time, especially uh, we're really appreciative of him taking time away. He's doing family stuff now. And so for him to still give us some time is is great. Um, I tell you, Greg, one thing I noticed from many years as a fan when watching Chipper play as a diehard fan who followed the team every day. And even now today that still holds true is I love hearing Chipper Jones speak whenever he's talking to the media or whoever and getting asked questions because he gives such thoughtful answers that are not cliche in the least, in my opinion, Mm -hmm. and that are insightful and they're just, uh, just flat out interesting, just really, really interesting. And, and and I just enjoy hearing it. And, uh, and that was no, then I, so what we got today with him is, is fully what I expected. I mean, I could listen to him talk all day. Um, so just first thoughts, I mean, uh, we finally have Chipper on behind the Braves. So that's a huge thing for us. And thanks to you for for putting that together, of course. Uh, but, uh, yeah, just uh, what are your thoughts on Chipper, the hitting coach and the and the speaker? Well, I'm excited. Today was our 80th episode. So uh, Chipper came on board. Um, I think this is, a, this is great for him. I'm excited for him because, like you said, uh, he's he first thing he did when the, there was an opportunity he called Alex and and uh, get back with the team. I think this is where he really um, is where he's passionate. I mean, he loves talking hitting. You know, he's one of the greatest hitters of all time, and and um, certainly in the Braves uniform. But I, I just when I hear him talk, he just there's some excitement in his voice. He gets fired up. I don't know calling some random Detroit Tigers and and Oakland Athletics game was going to get the same juices fired up that uh, that working with Freddie and and some of these guys in the you know um, down in the clubhouse in the batting cage I just I know that at least hitters man they spent so much time just talking absorbing uh, working uh, before the game after the game, just some of them are working during the game. Uh, you just have to eat. You got to eat it. You got to breathe it. You, you got to drink it. I mean, it just it's there's no there's no way to be a professional hitter and just not be absorbed in it. So I see him getting excited excited about that, and I think our, our fans will hear that too as as he talks about it. But I think he's in a great spot, and I'm I'm loving that we brought him back in, and he can help complement sites and what he's doing because I know these young, these young hitters and we've got a lot, I mean, we've got a young team, but these young hitters they're they're going to benefit greatly from him. And um, uh, it's just, it's great to hear that. I'm, I'm so excited for our organization because having guys like Terry Pendleton and Eddie Perez and Fred McGriff and, and Chipper and Andrew, having them still involved with the team, I just think it's so valuable. And I'm glad that our organization and our executives see the value in that. Absolutely. I was thinking I brought up briefly his uh, his book when we were talking with him and it's the the title of his book is so appropriate. It's just ball player, which, you know, I guess to somebody on the outside looking in, they could think, well, isn't that a little general? It's like, well, no, if you're really talking inside baseball here, ball player, it's it's the perfect title for that, because it's it's kind of like the term. 
you know, I don't know if we hear it as much these days, but a gamer, you know, because not not in the context of video games. I'm talking about in baseball mm-hmm. terms. You got a gamer. I mean, it's just somebody that it's just 100 percent what they are in their blood from morning from sun up to sundown. They're just a ball player. They're a baseball player. Even after they're done playing, they're 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 still that's still what's in their blood. That's still what fires them up mm-hmm. is that they're a ball player. It's it's I'll tell you this and, and me coming from the NASCAR world, that same kind of affection or whatever you want to call it is around the term racer. You say he's a racer. Well, they're all race car drivers, isn't he a racer? Well, <laughs> a racer is somebody that, yeah, he might be racing in the big one on Sunday, but during the week, he's also racing at the little dirt track down there on Tuesday night for a hundred dollar right. paycheck. Not because he needs a hundred bucks because he's just a racer. That's what he wants to do. It's what he lives and breathes. And, and it's interesting that it, I don't think that stops with a lot of these guys. And so it's great for us that, it's just great for us to have Chipper back and forward. I can't, of, of, of the many things that I am so excited about for Friday's home opener, I'm really excited just to be back in my little perch there in the in the press box and to look down and see number 10 walking around the hitting cage during BP before the game. I'm I'm truly excited about that. I think it's, it's going to be a welcome sight. You know, the current guys on the team have to love it. And, of course, with guys like with sites kind of leaving, leading the charge, I mean, obviously he does – great work as is and chipper is going to be another great addition to it so i'm just um gosh i'm just so excited he's he's always been in the fold since his retirement in one fashion or another but this is like this is to where we're pretty much going to see him i think at the ballpark a lot of days that's really really exciting thing for our entire organization and again like you said kudos to alex and the the baseball ops and the front office for for recognizing that Mm -hmm. yeah it'd be interesting to see where he goes with this because I think he's good. He's, he was there. He did a little bit of it, but it was right after he retired. And um, then he kind of got away from it, and now he's coming back. So I think that's a good sign. I, hopefully we're going to see more of him and uh, more involved with him because he's got a lot to give. I mean, like you said, you know, he's, he talks about in the interview kind of what his approach is going to be towards these guys. I think it's I think it's going to be uh, a good thing. You know, You know, now it's up to – you know, these guys to take advantage of and hopefully they will. Absolutely. And I I love his, his approach to it too, is like he's, and you'll hear how he talks about it, but he's saying, you know, I'm not going to go out here and try to make everybody hit like Chipper Jones or to have that style. It's, it's not, it doesn't work like that. And I think to be a successful coach, granted, you're the athlete here, not me. Don't be fooled by my physique, but I'm not. Um, But I think to be a successful coach that, that is, to me, from what I've observed, that uh, that's the biggest key is you can't make them do it the way things that you you think everybody like. There's not this one mold that fits everybody. It has to be you have to players have to adapt to things, but coaches have to adapt to players, too. And I think that's you can hear in Chipper and the way he's talking about his role, that that's how he's approaching this. So I think it's I think it's just going to be a great benefit for everybody. So I, I can't wait to see it. Um well, hey, I, I, by the way, I, we're, we're looking good here in game two. I don't want to jinx anything. So if we end up losing this thing, y'all can come back and yell at me later. But uh, we're, we're looking good. Hopefully we'll get another W. And, uh, man, I just can't wait to see everybody out at, at Truist Park on Friday. I'm just – man, we've come a long way. It's been – October 2019, that just seems like a lifetime ago. So if you're listening, you're going to be at the ballpark either Friday or whenever you're going to be at the ballpark this season. Uh, We can't wait to see you. So, all right. Well, without further ado, here he is, Hall of Famer, Chipper Jones. The winner. Here it is. It's gone. There it goes. And the Braves win it. For the second night in a row, the Marlins are beaten by a home run in the bottom of the ninth inning. The young star of the Braves, Chipper Jones, the Floridian. A shot deep to right. Well, welcome behind the Braves, uh, Chipper, and appreciate you uh, joining us and talking a little bit about baseball today. Uh, one of the things I want to ask you as I'm watching the Bravos here up in, in Washington, you've got a new role this year. Uh, you're working with the team. Can you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> Yeah, it was uh, kind of a new endeavor. Um, you know, once the uh, once Boog Shiambi took the job with the Cubs, I had kind of been thinking about maybe not doing the broadcasting thing this year. That made my decision pretty easy to, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, tell ESPN that I wasn't going to do it this year. And um, first call I made was to Alex Anthopoulos and, uh, you know, 
pretty much asked for my old job back. You know, I mean, the, the whole uh, assistance of the general manager is, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a little bit of a, a token title um, for, you know, past Braves and whatnot. But I wanted to be a little more involved. I don't want to be in uniform full time. Um, I don't want to be on the road. And so we just jockeyed around a, a few ideas and, and this is what we came up with. You know, I'm, I, I spent uh, three weeks to a month in spring training with the ball club. Um, I haven't seen them in probably three weeks now um, once I left spring training. So I'm kind of chopping it a bit to see the fellas and uh, they'll be back in town tonight and get ready for opening day on, on Friday. And hopefully we can, uh, they'll, they'll finish out this, this uh, road trip with a couple of W's and, and come home with some, some momentum. Well, I'm sure there were a bunch of those guys on the team that were, were loving uh, your decision and, and, and hoping that Alex would, uh, would bring you back in, which, you know, we all know that how much you love talking about hitting and being involved with these guys. And um, I mean, one of the things I wanted to ask you is, is, with these guys here on the team, do you, do you see something that you're trying to accomplish with them? I know as a big leaguer and you know, this, you know, it, when you're working in the, when you're actually working as a pitching coach and a hitting coach, I mean, you're not trying to change a whole lot. You're trying to help guys get the best out of themselves, but is there something, or did you pinpoint a few guys? You're like, man, I can't wait to work with that guy. Or, or is there some type of stamp that you, you see that you could bring to this team for this year? Um, I think, uh, approach more than anything else. These guys are pretty mechanically sound for the most part right now. Um, so yeah, like you said, I, I, I think the, the sign of a good instructor, whether it be a hitting instructing, hitting instructor or pitching coaches, not trying to make them prototypical Chipper Jones type of hitters. You need to do your homework and watch these guys and realize what works for them when they are going good and the little habits that they get into when they go wrong. And yes, there are a few guys that I was chomping at the bit to kind of get in the cage because I did see some things um, that I thought could help them. Um, you know, an Austin Riley pops to mind, Johan Camargo, but these guys, you know, the, the starters, I mean, they have their routines, they have their guys that they go to, they have their little drills and it's up to me to kind of shut up and step off to the side and watch, you know, what kind of, what kind of makes them work. The, the, the odd thing is, is that the fringe guys, the bench guys, those are the guys who just shower me with questions, shower mm -hmm. me with, uh, um, you know, wanting to, wanting to get in there and, and go to work. And it's it's really cool to see the guys who don't have the everyday jobs still hungry to, to learn and get better and, and, and try to try to crack the lineup. So, so Chipper, how do you envision for when we we get back home to Atlanta on a on a typical game day for home games? What is that that day going to look like for you in terms of your your role as hitting consultant? Um, most days that we'll be getting to the ballpark probably twelve thirty one o'clock, uh, very early. I want to uh, be there before everybody else is. Um, I want to take a look at the pitching matchup that night, uh, who the Braves are facing and, and, um, you know, it may entail looking at some video to see, you know, to kind of go through what I did preparation wise when I was playing. Okay. So if I was facing Greg McMichael on, you know, a given night, um, I would go back and look at his last three starts. I want to know where his head's at. Um, I want to know if he's 0-3. I want to know if he's 3-0. and I want to know if he's 0-0 with three no decisions. I want to see what's working for him, what's not working for him. Obviously, I know with Greg McMichael, I got to be sitting on that changeup at crunch time, you know? So all of these things go into um, kind of making up a, a game plan for, for 
you know, that given night's pitcher. Um, so that will be part of it. And then obviously accessibility, you know, you got to be there for the guys pregame, make sure they get all their drills done, make sure, um, you know, they're, they're, uh, rare, you know, they make it through BP. Okay. And then, you know, we, we start talking about approach for the game. Once batting practice is over, um, my job is pretty much done. I'm not allowed in the dugout because of the mandate on how many coaches you can have in the dugout. Um, I will obviously stick and watch the game on opening night, but most of the time I'll be probably gone from the ballpark by six, six thirty, and hopes that uh, I can make it home and have dinner and put the babies to bed uh, before, before they go to bed. All right, my, my next question then is, and Greg and I have talked about this, I think a, a quite a few times over the last few years of doing this show, um, the how players and coaches alike kind of have to stay even keeled throughout the season, no matter, not ever get too high, too low. And right. I've been thinking a lot about that the first few days of the season, just because 0-4 start, finally got the first win today. Hopefully, as we're sitting here, they're going to get their second win. But we approach things on this show. Greg is a former player, and I, even though I work with the team now, I still approach things, at least on this show, as a fan. So for fans, you know, you start the season 0-4, and, and it's like the sky is falling, end of the world. Yeah, yeah. And, and and especially me, I'm working on the social media side, so I'm reading all the comments, and it's, it's you know, the sky is definitely falling. But how right. do you guys – how do you as a player and then how do you as a coach impart to players – you know, not to ever just to try to stay even, not don't get too high and too low because it's, it's a long season. Yeah. It's, it's different when you start out the season. zero and four, that one hits, hits heavier. It's harder than it does when you have a four game skid in the middle of July. Um, you know, everybody, like you said, everybody thinks that, that this team's going to go. Oh, and 162. It's not going to happen. There's, there's, there's too many skilled ball players on this club. There's too many really good hitters for us to stay down very long offensively. Um, you know, you can take, uh, Max Fried's first two starts, for example, uh, over the first week. There's going to be a stretch where Max Fried is unhittable to help even out this, this you know, uncharacteristic stretch that we've seen from him in the first two starts. So, some like, like uh, Willie Stargell and all those guys uh, that I came up with, uh, Frank Howard, uh, whenever. I was in a skid where I went 0 for 15 or 0 for 20. They would always say, somebody's going to pay later on. You know, I mean, it, that's just that's just the way it is. If you, you know, if you're a 300 hitter, a leopard doesn't change the spots. At some point, he's going to get back to being, you know, a 300 hitter. And if he goes through a, a prolonged dry spell, you can be guaranteed they're going to go through an equally prolonged hot streak. Oh, by the way, I really miss Willie. Man, he was awesome, wasn't he? Yeah, he was great, wasn't he? Wow, what a class guy. Um, you know, I, I know that uh, we've had so many, you know, uh, being a part of this organization, we've we've been so fortunate to have so many guys. I know you've mentioned, mentioned Don Baylor before, and, of course, we've talked endlessly about Bobby and, and just some of the great um, people that we've got to rub shoulders with. So it makes me really think about these guys now and what they're getting to do. They're getting to work with you. Um, they're getting to work with Kevin and, and Walt and, um, you know, EY. And, and I just I think about the, yes, I think about these. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you can't say enough. We've had Wash on the show. He's been phenomenal. And I just I think about wonder what their perspective is. And will they be talking about this one day when they're in your position? Um, because, you know, honestly, it's what it takes, right? You know, how how blessed were, was I to be able to be on the same pitching staff with Smoltzy and Maddox and guys like Steve Bedrosian and um, Mark Walsh? You know, you just you can't help but get better. And I, I really have always appreciated that about our alumni and obviously you're right there in that category. It's just that we just had quality people that, that were great ball players, that were good teammates and just helped us in our careers. So I think about you and you give it back at this point. And so I, I wanted to ask you, you know, easily when you're a player, it's easy to judge success. 
because, you know, you look at the scoreboard, you look at the wins, you look at, you know, how the team's playing, but how, how do you think you're going to su- uh, judge success at this part of this, this stage in your life with the team? Uh, I think it, it, from a personal standpoint, it, it falls on the successes of the players. You know I mean? Mm-hmm. Obviously you go out and uh, um, you, you go 0 and 4 the, the first four games of the year and you go three for 32 with runners in scoring position and all that kind of stuff. You can't generate any offense. Heck, I was thinking I was going to get fired before I even got in <laughs> uniform for first home game. You know? uh, but I, I think as long as um, as long as you can avoid, I think as a coach, um, getting that look from a player where you're kind of talking to the back of their skull and they've <laughs> they tuned you out. I think any day you don't have that happen or, you know, that you can avoid that, that's a good day, you know? And, mm-hmm. and so you keep your points um, con- short, concise, to the point, and um, you can tell pretty much right away the guys that um, – you know, I mean, like uh, a, a Dansby Swanson, you know, his guy is Bobby Magianis. And apparent, you know, Bobby strikes a chord with Dansby. So mm-hmm. while we as a coaching staff will continue to communicate amongst each other and have a collaborative plan, Bobby Magianis is going to be the guy who gets in the cage and does the drills with Dansby, nobody else. And that's fine. I think that's why we work so, so good together. Um, But I think you have to be open-minded. You have to listen to the guys because, Hey, they, they, they got here for the most part without me, you know, other than maybe Freddie, you know? Um, So, and and Freddie, I, I very rarely have to say anything to Freddie because he has the exact same, uh, approach at the plate that I do. I think once you start forcing your will upon um, players, they tune you out. And I want to avoid that. I want to have communication. I'll offer little tidbits here and there, and you can tell the ones that that keep coming back for more information. Those are the guys that you're really going to click with. I'm, I'm glad you brought up Freddie. I wanted to ask you about your relationship with him. I mean, you were the face of the franchise for, for a generation. And now I, I would say Freddie is the the face of this current generation of the Atlanta Braves. And I just wanted to know, when did you kind of first notice that, or think that Freddie was, was cut out to be that guy? I mean, the guy that the, the, that is the face that talks to the press when things are good, or especially when things are bad. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, one thing to have the great numbers on the back of the baseball card, but that's a whole nother level of pressure. I think just from a fan perspective of being the guy, the guy, the face of the team. So when did you kind of first start to see that? Hey, Freddie, I think is cut out for this role. Well, I knew from day one personality wise that, that he had what it took. I knew that he would be a media darling because he's got such an infectious, you know, personality, you know, big smile and, hugs everybody and just, you know, everybody, everybody loves the kid to death. Now that's only a part of it. And I knew that Freddie was going to be a good player. I had no idea he would turn out to be, you know, uh, this kind of ball player. I mean, he has really worked hard. Um, even since I retired to get bigger, faster, stronger, um, perfect his craft, um, and while we do have some conversations every once in a while through the through the years, um, you know, he's he's pretty much been self-taught. You know, I mean, he got a relationship much like I did with my dad, with his dad, you know, and and they work well together. And um, so it's just been really cool to see that that maturation process. It is not easy having to be the person that has to stand up in front of the horde of reporters every night, whether you win or lose, um, whether you go four for four or oh for four, whether you feel like it or not. Um, but 
you know, that's that's part of the responsibility. We, we, we play in a very big city. We play um, – we're, we're very successful here in Atlanta, so we're going to have a lot of media coverage. Got a lot of good players, a lot of superstars. And uh, when you play in the playoffs in the, in the World Series, it's going to garner attention. And uh, you need – those guys that uh, that collectively speak for everyone who, who dons that uniform on a daily basis. Chipper, I, uh, this is uh, probably the last question I have for you. I just I, I tell people this all the time because I don't think you are given the credit that you deserve at third base. I think that you are one of the best third basemen we ever had. I think you did a great job, but I want you to be honest. Tell Ricky and our fans, tell them who allowed you to be such a great third baseman. Uh, I think it was a, kind of a collaborative thing. You know, I never played third base until I got to the big leagues, ever. Never played an yeah. inning at third base until I got to the big leagues. But I was a good enough athlete, having come up as a shortstop, um, that I could make the adjustment. And I think, um, you know, I have to thank uh, the Glenn Hubbards of the world um, who worked so much with me when I was a middle infielder um, coming up through the minors. Um, obviously, the man, you know, as, as far as my mentor was Terry Pendleton. I mean, you're talking about switch hitter, you're talking about third baseman, you're talking about leader in the clubhouse. I mean, you were there. I mean, like – he ran that clubhouse when he was there. He policed that clubhouse. If something needed to be said to somebody, he said it. If somebody needed to, you know, call a team meeting and, and address something, he did it. And, you know, I mean, he just set so many good examples for me, you know, whether it's playing through nagging injuries and, and knowing that, that, me out there at 75 or 80 percent is better than anything else we got so you better strap it up um things like that um Mm. knowing your audience knowing um what teammates need to be patted on the back what teammates need to have a foot stuck in their rear end um all these things i learned from terry pendleton so you know it was a there were a, a couple of instructors along the way that 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 really helped me but uh terry pendleton helped me become a a true pro well you know you can be taught all you want but i mean what was the pitcher that allowed you to practice those skills when you were at third base who got the balls that were hit the hardest to you (laughs) you were were definitely high on the list my friend (laughs) i wasn't trying to miss bats (laughs) I just remember the ball that Big Cat uh, in game one of the division series in Colorado uh, late in game one. That may have been the best play I ever made in my life, and I'm I'm certainly glad it was behind you, buddy. <laughs> yeah, me too. You know, I made I made Ray Dordonias look pretty good in New York too. We had an un, we had an uh, unassisted triple play, so uh, you oh, know I, I'm I'm all about lifting up the guys behind me. Well. Ray was a truly gifted defender. <laughs> I was I was more the gifted offensive guy, uh, but uh, Ray or, Ray Ordonez was certainly as slick as they come on D. Yeah, he was that. Yeah, I had a feeling that that play was going to come up. Cause Greg and I don't ever compare notes, or rarely before we do these, we like to just just ask, yeah. just write down our own notes on our own, and then we ask the questions, have a conversation. But I literally, I don't know if you can see us, Chipper, but I, I have your book, and I went back and read uh, that that passage because I knew Greg was going to ask about that ninety five uh, that ninety five division series play because he's, I've heard there's some debate with him if if that was a great pitch or a great play. So I'm glad to get to the truth of it today. I'll, I'll, I'll give credit to both because, hey, listen, um, you know, that me being in position to make that play is in direct relation to having played behind him so much all season and, and knowing the hitter in Andres Galarraga and what he would probably do to that pitch, you know, if he, if he 
got about on it, you know. And and once Blouser let me know that changeup was coming, I took a couple little quick shuffle steps to my right and just laid out. And man, thank goodness for for Mac and me and all of Braves country. That ball stuck in my glove. <laughs> Man, that that what a series that was! That was uh, I don't think everybody realizes how tough that series was with those guys. They were they were scary. I mean, they were you know people talk about the World Series and us going up against the Indians, but I don't really know that people can appreciate that offense in in that ballpark. Mm-hmm. You know, they they weren't called the Blake Street Bombers for nothing. They were scary from from top to bottom. You know, and and uh, we were very fortunate to uh, to get out of there alive. <laughs> Isn't it funny how just that ballpark took a little confidence away from the pitcher, and it gave a little bit more confidence to the hitter? And what a bad dynamic that was for for uh, the defense. You know, I've never been, I've never played games in a ballpark where the ebbs and flows and the roller coaster ride mm. was was you know the peaks and valleys the the difference in the two were just you know so so great you know and and you literally get done with a three and a half four hour game there and at Coors Field and you come in and you just be whipped you know mentally physically uh just just done and uh no other place was really like that for me yeah I, I would agree I would agree. Well, hey, you make sure that Taylor knows how appreciative we are of letting uh, letting you come on. And I'll let y'all say to her. There she is. All right. Hey, Taylor. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. Appreciate that. We can't see you, but uh, but we know you're there. <laughs> Thank you. All right, guys. Well, I enjoyed it. All right. You take care. Have a good Thanks, trip. Sir. See ya. See you guys. High in the air, deep left center field. Did he get enough? Rondell White to the wall. It's gone, and the Braves win. Chipper Jones, his 41st home run, his 98th RBI. It gives the Braves a two-game lead in the National League East. Our thanks again to Hall of Famer Chipper Jones for joining us here on Behind the Braves. That was that was awesome. Uh, it, it's man, I, I'm already just fired up and can't wait to have him on again. You know, hopefully, hopefully we're talking to him after we have a world another World Series trophy uh, this this year. That'd be nice. I'm just putting that into the universe so that it'll it'll happen. Right? My girlfriend <laughs> like preaches that to me. Just if you want something to happen bad enough, just put it out in the universe. And that's right. Put it out there. That's right. <laughs> well, you know what? You know what? That's also kind of that's what prayer is, right? You just put it. You kind of, yeah. You got to say it, right? <laughs> that's it's all it's all connected. Yep, completely agree. Just yeah, power, positive thinking, prayer, whatever however you want to view it. I believe it. It's all all good things. Um, speaking of good things. We haven't gotten to do if you if you're a long time listener to Behind the Braves, you'll remember a lot of times we used to uh, promote this little thing called Alumni Sunday. And of course, we didn't have you guys, the fans at the ballpark last year, so we couldn't have Alumni Sunday. But by God, it's back. It is back this weekend. The fans are back. Alumni Sunday is back this weekend. And uh, we're getting started with the bang, aren't we, Greg? We are super excited. Uh, This is something that I was doing for 10 plus years and just all of a sudden it was taken away. I think everybody kind of felt the same thing about parts of the game that we just did not get to experience. And one of those is alumni Sunday, alumni weekend. So I'm here to say we're back. Uh, Alumni Sunday is going to be this Sunday and uh, we're going to have Dale Murphy. I'm going to be interviewing him on the Georgia pavilion stage out in the plaza in the battery. So super excited about that. We'll be out there. We'll be talking about um, everything Braves related. And then the following week, I'll have another guest. And then hopefully in May, we'll be back to our normal uh, Alumni Sunday autographs and and all that good stuff um, out in the plaza. But we're at least going to be out there. Uh, We hope you'll come out and see us and then look forward to uh, Alumni Weekend, which is going to be at the end of May. 21st to the 23rd. So uh, super excited about that as well, bringing back all the alumni for uh, a Ford alumni weekend. So uh, look for more details about that, but uh, hope you'll come out and join us on Sunday for alumni Sunday with Dale Murphy. 
Yeah, Braves Alumni Weekend is always one of my favorite weekends of the year. It's just so much fun. All the guys from all the different areas that you bring back into town, and you do such a good job of putting all that together. And it's it's fun for all the guys. You can tell everybody's just happy to be there, and the fans. It's a lot of great events for the fans, and it's just good vibes all around that weekend. And and then for Alumni Sunday, I mean, this was before I even started working with you, before I started working with the Braves when I was just a fan. I loved coming down to coming. I was even when I would come down to Atlanta for a weekend, wasn't living here, but I would plan a week, at least one weekend every year to, to come down to some Braves games from Virginia. And I always look forward to checking that schedule when I had that date locked in of like, all right, who's like, who's going to be here for alumni Sunday? Like who could I potentially meet or maybe get an autograph from, or get to hear speak? Like we're going to hear Dale speak, uh, with you on Sunday. So that's always great. I mean, it's just a great thing. Um, and we've got such a rich tradition here, such a strong alumni group and association that you've built that uh, every Sunday, you know, you're going to see a Braves legend and a lot of Sundays you're going to see multiple Braves legends out there. So man, just, it's, it's just so good to have all the, all nature is healing. Things are coming back. So it's, it's great to see. And uh, I think Dale's restaurant is reopening this weekend too. Great. The- yeah. Go get some cheese curds. Yeah, they're good. We can, vouch for those things they are legit that's right that's right well good deal well our thanks again to chipper jones for joining us and to all of you for listening we're really excited to be back and uh we'll be with you every week now and behind the braves this is the off season's over the regular season's here so we we be back with you uh every week with a new episode so can't wait uh for greg mcmichael i'm ricky mast we'll see you next week on behind the braves Hey, Braves country. We just wanted to remind you to rate, review, and subscribe Behind the Braves on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or at braves.com slash Behind the Braves, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you, and we'll see you next time on Behind the Braves. Behind the Braves.